first of all, tonight, we are going to start with our guest. Oftentimes we close with our guest, but tonight we're going to get the program off with a highlight, let's say, because, you know, usually we end with the highlight, but tonight we're going to begin with it. Um, and we are going to talk about massive stars and also about a book that our guest has written called The Last Stargazers and even hear a little bit from that that book. So welcome, Emily. And uh, you can call me David, of course, as well. But welcome to our program. Hi, thanks so much for inviting me. Ab absolutely. Well, you are an expert and you research and study big stars, massive stars. So I wanted to bring this up. It's not the most high res folks, but it works good enough. But I wanted to point out what a massive star is. So first of all, anybody see the sun on here? Anybody see our sun? Well, let me get our laser pointer out. The sun is kind of in the center. It's right below the laser pointer where I have there, that one single pixel there, that little dot. So our sun is not a massive star. So that's not the sort of star you study, I take it. Um, you study stars more like Betelgeuse and, um, you know, Antares and, you know, even some of the blue ones, I suppose, because the blue ones on the main sequence turn into the red ones, as as we might talk about. Um, so this is sort of the different sizes of stars, and our sun is a relatively modestly sized star, and size and mass don't always correlate. So maybe we'll talk about that a little bit tonight, too. They do somewhat, but you can have a low mass star that actually is physically bigger than a star that is of higher mass. So. We might talk about that. Um, here is a diagram that actually kind of shows that relationship. This is our very own um, color magnitude diagram um, in Griffith Observatory. And we recently have refurbished this. The colors are bright and beautiful. And the color corresponds to temperature, but also it does correspond to mass. Massive stars along that main sequence you see there that corresponds to a sequence of mass. The stars in the lower right are low mass, and the stars up over here are high mass. Now, what's going on up over here and well down here with the white dwarfs, that has to do with stellar evolution. And um, we'll talk a little bit about that. Now, let me bring the text version, the textbook version of this one on. And you can see it here. And you can see on this plot is stellar radius. And the sun is located right now above my laser pointer there, you can see. And it has a size of one. Conveniently enough, our sun has a size of one. But baby juice is all the way up here at the top. And it's just, you know, it's like 700, 800 times the size of the sun. No, oh, yeah, 10 to the three is a thousand. I could still do math one of these days. Um, so Betelgeuse is a huge star. And as we all heard in the night sky, Betelgeuse is in the sort of shoulder of Orion. Oh, that's a low res picture that I picked for you all. Um, but Orion is gonna start to be visible early, early in the morning. And you wanna get up extra early and see it or whether you wanna stay up late like I would normally be this time of year. Most of you know, I normally go out to the Burning Man Festival. This year it's not happening officially, although there are some crazy people out there on their own, even some people I know, but we'd always know it was getting late in the night while we're out riding bikes, looking at art and whatnot, when we'd see Betelgeuse rise. And I'd look up at, I'd look up at the star, you'd see Orion, I'd look at Betelgeuse and I'd think, when are you gonna blow up? Well, in the news recently, well, recently, this is now a couple of years ago, um, the pandemic, everything feels recently, but there were things talking about the fainting of Betelgeuse. So we decided, oh my goodness, I'm fainting. So we thought Betelgeuse had a little problem and fainted. But really what was going on, of course, is Betelgeuse was dimming. And in January, 2020, it was really dim. It was quite a bit fainter. And the V magnitude is sort of a green color, um, sort of a peak of the visual. It's getting fainter. You saw diagrams like this where you see the observed, observed points getting fainter and fainter and fainter. And some folks were predicting maybe it would bottom out and start to come back up. And indeed it did bottom out and return to brightness, but it was a star of a lot of interest to folks. And here's the picture. This is an actual image um, using the VLT in January, 2019, before the dimming took place. And here's a picture after the dimming took place. So I'll, I'll back it up again and go forward. So something was going on. It looked like the Southern hemisphere, if we think North is up, I don't know if it actually is at North is up on this picture, but the lower hemisphere of this star image we're seeing is dimmer. Something was going on there. And folks were thinking, well, could this be giant star spots on it? I reported on it at the time they thought it was that. And, um, but people really weren't sure. A lot of craziness was going on. I love this account on Twitter that was created. Is Betelgeuse okay? And um, it gets a little spicy at times, a little, a little salty, but um, I install one dimmer switch in my dining room, the entire galaxy loses its 
okay, we can't say that word on our family program. Um, I did that talk, of course, what's up with Betelgeuse, and um, the, the account noticed we were doing it, which I thought was great fun. Uh, I did tweet at the account again. I was hoping they'd notice we're talking again tonight. Um, but anyway, our very own you know, guest tonight works on Betelgeuse, and you had a paper come out that you said it was dust. In fact, you were the first group to make that well, scientific paper to prove it scientifically. People were throwing out all sorts of hypotheses and ideas about what it could be. So how did you come to that conclusion and what observations did you make to, to look at Betelgeuse? Yeah, well, first of all, it's worth mentioning why we're so interested in Betelgeuse in the first place, because Betelgeuse is the exact type of star that I study. It's a red supergiant. Um, we tend to have a soft spot for Betelgeuse as astronomers because it's wonderfully nearby. It's a naked eye star, so we can just look up and keep an eye on it. And it's actually a very kind of garden variety red supergiant. You mentioned how big it is. And if you were to drop Betelgeuse where our sun is, it would swallow up Mars. It would actually make it most of the way to the orbit of Jupiter. And that makes it a medium-sized red supergiant. We've actually discovered red supergiants that would eat Jupiter and get close to the orbit of Saturn. So it becomes a really excellent nearby archetype for us to study in detail. And when it started to dim, it caught a lot of people's curiosity because we haven't generally seen other red supergiants do that. And we wanted to understand whether this was something very unusual happening or a fairly normal stage in a red supergiant's life that could give us a few more hints to how these stars work. And we're interested in stars like this because, like you said, they are the stars that die as supernovae. So when the dimming happened, all of these headlines came out and um, a lot of science reporters know that Betelgeuse is an aged massive star that's getting ready to end its life. So there were tons of breathless headlines saying, is it going to blow? Is Betelgeuse about to explode? Dimming, is this the end? And lots of headlines going, astronomers baffled, waiting for it to blow. And a lot of us were being a bit more cautious, but saying, you know, we want to get to the bottom of what's going on. And I recognize as the author of the first paper to put this out that dust is about the most disappointing sounding explanation possible. You want to hear, you know, wow, something really dramatic is happening to the star. It's about to die. It's, you know, doing something really exciting and it's dusty. Doesn't sound exciting, but it really is. So what we ultimately figured out had happened, and this started with our paper and a bunch of other papers since then have looked into Betelgeuse's behavior more, is about a year, about a year before it started to get really dim, Betelgeuse puffed off some material from its outer layers. So because these stars are so big and cold, their outer layers are really kind of diffuse and not that dense. And from these stars just sort of pulsating and being a little bit unstable, they'll sort of fuff off material into their surroundings. That material will then cool off and eventually turn into what we see as dust. And that dust in front of the star will block our view, much like dust on our windows makes our view look dimmer, and will make Betelgeuse appear to dim. So before the dimming happened, that material got puffed off. One of those big star spots that you described wound up rotating right into our line of sight and cooling off the environment right around Betelgeuse, which made that gas then turn into dust. That dust blocked our view and we got that sudden really dramatic dimming that we saw as Betelgeuse starting to disappear. So we took observations of Betelgeuse that let us measure its temperature and we saw, okay, the temperature really hasn't changed that much. If it had cooled off a lot, it might have looked dimmer. Since the temperature hadn't changed, we tried to look at how much light we were getting at different colors, like how much blue light were we getting from Betelgeuse, how much yellow, how much red. And the way that light had changed when Betelgeuse dimmed told us that there was some weird big dust grains blocking our view. And then other researchers did amazing observations with huge telescopes, with the Hubble Space Telescope, with pretty much every instrument we could point at Betelgeuse to figure out this background of that initial burst of mass loss and the cold spot that helped the dust form. And we pieced together the story in the end, but it wound up being a kind of normal thing that you would expect a star like Betelgeuse to do. Okay, so you're saying it was not aliens. <laughs> Definitely not aliens. Now, yeah, I, now I'm, I'm I, surprised yeah. that someone in the news didn't propose that, though, because it happens I, everywhere. I mean, of course, there was the um, uh, Bojoyan star, Tabby star. I'm trying to remember the last name. But yeah. the one where everyone was like, oh, my God, it's a massive superstructure of alien technology dimming this star in the front. Um, they concluded that was also dust dimming it, but it was sort of patchy in some sort of way. 
do you know anything? I mean, that's not a massive star, but no, um, it was a low mass star. Yeah. yeah, I, I honestly, I don't recall what the ultimate explanation was for that star. Which the nickname I love for it is the WTF star, which of course stands for Where's the Flux, um, yeah, and they saw it get a lot dimmer. It was a great session in the AAS, the, the WTF. I was, I, yeah. Well, I saw the session. I forget whether it was remote or in person, but um, it was great. And as I recall, it had it had something to do with the potential swarm of comets passing by it. But people had a lot of fun imagining an alien mega structured Dyson sphere built around this star. Um, one reason I don't think that ever got pitched for Betelgeuse <laughs> is because, like all massive stars. Um, I mean, I didn't see it get pitched very many places. I'm sure it was somewhere. But like all massive stars, Betelgeuse is actually pretty young. Because these stars have so much mass, they fuse elements in their cores through processes that really rip through those elements and those available fuels very quickly. So Betelgeuse, despite being much bigger than our sun, isn't going to live nearly as long as our sun. These stars live 10 million with an M years as opposed to the 10 billion with a B that our sun lives. And we think that you need much longer to make the sort of planets that could make a civilization that could then make space flight, that could then make Dyson spheres. So I think that's what saved us from an alien scenario in Betelgeuse's case. So you're saying they were rational, which I don't believe, but um, in any case, big stars, <laughs> massive stars, they do live fast, die young. It's that old, you know, they just do. They're, 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 they don't go through their lives very fast. I early on in this show's history made the mistake of saying hot young stars, not making a connection of where we were in Hollywood. And our uh, Laura Danley, our Dr. Danley, our old boss, she continually made fun of that for me, and I had to say it forever. So I still do. It's good fun, but it's true. The hot young ones stay young even right before they're going to die. Um, Betelgeuse, when it explodes, it'll create a whole bunch of heavy elements and things like that, generate a shock wave and all the rest. Now. How bright will it get in our sky? I've heard some people say you might be able to read a newspaper by it. Um, Patrick made a wonderful graphic. Check it on one of the old shows. You can go look up. We've shown it a few times that showed it in the sky. But what is your take on it as someone that studies Betelgeuse? So I actually had a few colleagues do back of the envelope math when Betelgeuse's dimming was happening because everyone was imagining a Betelgeuse supernova. And if it is up in the nighttime sky when it goes supernova, we might not be able to, you know, easily read a newspaper by its light, but at its peak, it could be as bright as the full moon. If it was up in the daytime sky when it went supernova, that might be visible during the day. It would sort of look like, you know, Venus in the morning. And a lot of this is really speculative because there's a lot we still don't know about supernovae. Um, a thing that we would love to be able to do in astronomy but can't yet is to point at a star like Betelgeuse's day. That star is going to go supernova on this date or in this many years, and it's going to look like this. We have great guesses about sort of what elements will be created in a supernova like that and roughly what it'll look like. But our general rule of thumb is, well, we think Betelgeuse will go supernova soon. And soon is, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, a mere minute in cosmic time, but not really what we hope for if we want to watch it explode tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Um, are there any in the sky that might go sooner? Do you have any candidates that we should be watching? You know, I'm a big fan of Betelgeuse, and like I said, the the big difficulty when all of these headlines started coming out saying, does dimming mean Betelgeuse is going to explode? A lot of reporters asked me and my colleagues these questions, and our answers were always, no, probably. And a couple people called us out on the probably, but we really did mean it, because we don't know what a star looks like in the days or hours before it explodes. And we don't know what the death throes of a star might look like. There wasn't a lot of evidence that would look, that it would look like this slow dimming, but there wasn't all evidence that it wouldn't look like that. So Betelgeuse is a good candidate. And Terry's and a couple of our other neighbor red supergiants are pretty good. Um, and there are a couple other weird massive stars. There's a star named Eta Carina <laughs> in the Southern Hemisphere. Somebody knew I was going to say that star. That Absolutely. Is it is in this wonderful class of stars called luminous blue variables, and they're named to be exactly what they look like. They're very bright, they're blue, they're very hot, and they're very variable. These stars can actually do what I think of as faking their own deaths because they will puff off so much mass and do it so violently that it looks like the star has brightened 
and gone supernova. And we know that this happens near the end of these stars' evolution, so who knows, maybe Eta Carina will be the one that surprises us. There are other stars that used to be red supergiants and have puffed up so much mass that their outer layers have just been peeled off, and they turn into really hot stars before they die. One of those could make a supernova. We have a few of those that we could see. But we haven't had a supernova visible from Earth in the Milky Way since 1604. So it would be really cool to have one happen. I think every supernova astronomer would get wildly excited. Oh, ab absolutely. Um, what's the nearest type two supernova, which by the way, is the type that Betelgeuse is going to be. There's two types, one's a white dwarf that has, somehow gets extra mass, whether it's colliding white dwarfs or material dumped over, but Betelgeuse being a single star, it'll be at the end of its life. It'll process elements heavier and heavier and heavier, generating the energy it needs to hold itself up against gravity once it makes, well, it makes nickel, which rapidly decays down to iron. So we often we'll hear us say when that core is all iron, it has nowhere to get energy out of it and it actually will collapse and then explode. There's a, a rebound, we believe. But what is the nearest supernova like that that we've seen since the modern age of telescopes, say? That's, that's a good question. Um, and this, so since the modern age of telescopes, we have not seen a galactic supernova. Um, the telescope was invented in about 1608, and the last one we saw was in 1604. The nearest, though, type two supernova with a star like Betelgeuse collapsing is actually a supernova a lot of people know because it left behind what we call the Crab Nebula. So the supernova itself was about 6,500 light years away, and it happened in the year 1054. And we actually have records in Chinese and Arabic astronomy of what they call the guest star. It showed up in the night sky for a while and then it left. And there's cave art in New Mexico depicting, we think, this supernova showing up in the daytime sky. And now it's one of the most famous objects in the night sky. Like Hubble takes pictures of the Crab Nebula all the time. We have X-ray images of it. People have it as, you know, desktop backgrounds. So that was probably our near, that I think is our nearest type two supernova that's ever happened. And that was, you know, nearly a thousand years ago. So all the others have been outside our galaxy that we've been studying. You have to get lucky, know someone that has some Gemini time, the telescope that we have up, by the way, that maybe you've seen. And that, that's yes. you down there at Gemini. Now that's Gemini South, that's down in, yep. in Chile. That's the Gemini South Telescope in Chile, and I'm being as good a scale model as I can be at five foot two, but the mirror of that telescope is almost 27 feet from end to end. And it gives you a sense of the scale of the really enormous telescopes that we get to work with professionally for our jobs. Yeah, now that's that's amazing. Um, being able to create monolithic mirrors like that, eight meters is about what we think is the maximum we're able to do with reasonable technology. So folks have started to combine eight meter mirrors. They have you know, the LBT and others. Um, and even now with some of the giant telescopes coming, Keck led the way for smaller segments being used altogether. But a single monolithic mirror like this, it still blows me away. It almost looks like someone's Newtonian, you know, one that's out on the front laundry in one of our star parties. And somehow through the trick of the eye in perspective, you're, it, it blows my mind that we have telescopes that large that we can use despite having used them myself. Um, so you it's know, just crazy. What, the laboratory that builds, um, that does, it builds these sorts of mirrors, um, the size of that mirror that I'm standing under is pretty much the biggest mirror that they can make because they make it in this huge spinning oven where they basically pour in glass, heat it up until it turns molten and they spin it so it makes that perfect curved shape that you need for a telescope mirror. And one of the next generation telescopes we're building right now is the giant Magellan telescope, which is also being planned for Chile. And it is seven of those mirrors that I'm standing under right now, mosaic together to make one humongous telescope. Which is just crazy, absolutely crazy. By the way, yeah. one of the comments in our uh, chat, the YouTube chat, somebody said uh, the uh, 1987A, the supernova in the LMC was a type two, which I'd forgotten that, but that was the most recent near, quote unquote, meaning in an external dwarf galaxy orbiting our own. And it's, it's so quite far yes. away. That's, that's it was about different. two, that would have been about 200,000 light years-ish away. I will say though, it was a naked eye 
supernova only just. It was discovered by a telescope operator in Chile named Oscar Duhalde, who knew the little satellite galaxy that it appeared in so well that when he wandered out in the middle of observing one night and spotted the sector point of light, he remembered, oh, that that's strange. And when people go back and compare the times, he was the first person to see that supernova. Wow. Pretty neat. Pretty neat. Yeah. Now, yeah. You, in addition to observing massive stars, you've written a book about people observing and what goes on. Um, yes, and I have. Yeah. We'd love to hear a little bit about that. So, for, well, first of all, what got you inspired to write a book? Um, so I, so the book is The Last Stargazers. I'll hold up the copy that I keep by my computer. And it's basically a book of behind the scenes stories of what it's like to be a professional astronomer. And where the idea came from is that it's really not hard to sell people on the idea of space and space being exciting and cool. But not a lot of people know the backstory of how we study space. They'll admire, you know, the big gorgeous pictures from Hubble, but they don't know where the pictures come from and the jobs of the people who take them. I've met people on an airplane and told them I'm an astronomer, and they've said things like, oh, do you have your own telescope in your backyard? And unfortunately, Gemini wouldn't quite fit in my backyard, and you absolutely would not want to put it in Seattle. Or they'll ask, you know, do you go to Hubble personally? Which again, I would love to, but I do not. Or they'll ask, how are you awake right now? If you're an astronomer, aren't you just nocturnal? And don't you just spend every night at a telescope waiting for Betelgeuse to explode or for something to happen? And when you go to an astronomy conference and talk to other astronomers about the last time you used a telescope. The conversation inevitably devolves into just like sea stories and tall tales. And did you ever hear about that guy that had a raccoon crawl into his lap at a telescope? Or did you ever hear about the telescope that got shot? Or did you hear about the guy that was observing when Mount St. Helens erupted? And all of these are true stories. And I realized that they were wonderful stories to share with people. They're sharing the tales of how we use these telescopes in an era where the technology is really rapidly changing. And to understand the stories, you learn the science along the way. So that's where the idea for the book came from. Um, well, that, that's awesome, because indeed, you're, you're absolutely right. People exchange stories, they tell tales about, you know, driving to the telescope in the middle of the night, strange metal works being laid across the highway with nobody there. How did it get there? They turn around, go back to the telescope, call some people, like, what's going on? They drive back, it's gone. <laughs> it, it looked like a bridge to let tanks drive across the road, by the way, was what it was. So probably in the middle of the night, the Marine Corps is like, we can't tear up the highway. We got to get the tanks from one side to the other. They were driving across and along came the poor astronomer on a cloudy, humid night or whatever it was and ran into this. So there's crazy stuff like that that happened. But also um, now everybody out in our audience is going to want to know any tales of people seeing aliens or you UFOs. Know, you know Oh, people, people ask me that. So I interviewed more than 100 fellow astronomers for the book, and I didn't have a single person tell me a story of spotting, first of all, definitely not aliens. Um, I did have a few stories that for a brief moment in someone's experience were unidentified flying objects, and then they promptly identified them. But astronomers, even people who, are, who stare at the night sky for their jobs, would get tricked by Venus looking really bright and diffuse on the horizon. Or they'd see a flock of geese flying high in the sky with their little white bellies lit by a setting sun, and they'd have a moment of going, what is flying? So it's very easy to think an object is unidentified, but the astronomers always quickly figured out what they were. And I did talk to people whose job um, focuses on astrobiology and on studying what life would be like on other planets. None of those fields focus on these um, other life forms visiting us. They're more focused on finding the planets where they could potentially live. Exactly. I, I, my point in all of that, you went, we did not pre-plan this. I just happened to know through speaking to lots of astronomers, none of us have ever seen a UFO. Now we've seen some things in the sky that you might be like, oh, I don't know what that is. It's blinking weird. But none of us leap to the conclusion that it is an alien spacecraft going across the sky. It's just, anyhow, folks, we'll have that discussion another night. But we're, we spend our lives on top of mountains in the dark looking at the sky and, and you'd think those would be the folks that would be seeing stuff, but maybe, you know, anyhow. Um, now, there are all sorts of tales. Would you, are, would you be so kind as to read one for us? Would you do that for our audience? I absolutely can. Um, awesome. I will now I can up... switch forward here to- um, Perfect. First of all, yeah. this telescope. 
Yes, and this is a great place to start, which I'll describe in a minute. I'm pulling up my lovely ebook copy of hey. my book. Yeah. And now, I'll folks, start. Yep, sorry. You know, I was just going to say, as you bring that up, I was going to say, and I, I highly recommend folks go to your local bookstore, buy a copy. If you're like me and you read ebooks as well, that's fine. Buy it from wherever you can. But local bookshops could use your help. So just buy it. <laughs> I'll give a quick plug that the print version of the book is beautiful because I have this beautiful cover art that my publisher helped create of the Milky Way. And if you take off the dust jacket, you get a surprise because the book itself has this beautiful star field on it. So I was lucky to get an especially pretty hardcover design for the book. But I'll read the opening of the book and I'll point out too that this is how my book of tales of adventures at telescopes and adventures of studying the universe opens. I wound up with a very exciting opening line. So here we go. Have you tried turning it off and back on again? This phrase repeated by weary IT specialists the world over has possibly never prompted such horror. It was one in the morning and I was sitting in a chilly control room on top of the highest mountain in Hawaii. I was nearly 14,000 feet above sea level, 24 years old, and fighting through sleep and oxygen deprivation to salvage several hard-won hours of research time for my PhD thesis on a piece of broken equipment. The equipment in question was the Subaru Telescope, a 630-ton beast housed one floor above my head in a 14-story dome. The telescope boasted a pristine primary mirror more than 27 feet in diameter the largest single piece of glass in the world. That mirror reflected starlight into a suite of some of the most sophisticated scientific instruments on the planet. It cost $47,000 per night to operate, and after submitting a 12-page science proposal to my department, I had been granted one precious night, tonight, the only night allotted to me in the entire year, to point that telescope at a handful of galaxies five billion light years away. So no, I had not tried turning it off and back on again. The evening had been going excellently until one of the control room computers had produced an unsettling blunk sound, prompting the telescope operator, the only other person with me on the mountain, to freeze in her seat. When I asked her what was wrong, she explained that one of the mechanized supports holding up a mirror had just failed, but reassured me, it's okay, I think the mirror is still on the telescope. You think, I replied. Yeah, if it wasn't, we would have heard a crash. Solid reasoning, but not exactly reassuring. We'd apparently gotten lucky with how Subaru was positioned when its support mechanism failed, preventing an immediate disaster. For now, it was still holding up the secondary mirror, notably smaller than the enormous primary mirror, but still four feet wide, 400 pounds, and suspended 73 feet in the air, tasked with redirecting light into the camera I was using. Unfortunately, if we moved the telescope again, we risked dumping that secondary onto the floor. And that was if we were lucky. If we were unlucky, it would hit the primary on its way down. We put in a nervous call to the Subaru day crew, a group of engineers who worked on maintaining the 13 telescopes on the mountain during the daylight hours when the astronomers were asleep. The Japanese crew member we reached cheerfully informed us that this was probably the same error they'd seen earlier in the day. The mechanized supports were probably fine. It was probably just a false alarm, and turning the power off and on again would probably fix the problem. It seemed impolite to point out that we were talking about a multi-million dollar telescope and not a modem. I didn't know what 400 pounds of glass hitting the concrete floor above my head would sound like, but I knew I didn't want to find out. I was also quite sure I didn't want to be forever known as the grad student who killed Subaru. I'd heard too many I broke the telescope stories over the years to ignore the fact that this was a very real possibility. One of my colleagues had destroyed an outlandishly expensive digital camera on a telescope by innocently touching two of the wrong wires together. Another had slammed the business end of a telescope into a movable platform inside the dome partway through a sleep deprived night. Sometimes these sorts of failures weren't even anyone's fault. A gargantuan 300-foot-wide radio telescope in West Virginia had just up and collapsed one evening, crumpling like a stepped-on soda can partway through an observation. I couldn't remember exactly what had caused the infamous West Virginia failure, but I was convinced the words mechanized support and probably had been involved. The cautious thing for me to do would be to call it a night, 
drive back down to the observatory sleeping quarters and have the day crew carefully check things over the next morning. On the other hand, this was my only night on the telescope. Tomorrow, it wouldn't matter whether I'd experienced a mechanical failure, a false alarm, or even just a poorly timed cloud. Telescope time is strictly scheduled months in advance, and another astronomer would be arriving to use Subaru for a completely different research program. All that would matter was that my night had come and gone without completing my observations. I would have to submit a whole new proposal, hope for another hard to get yes from the telescope committee, wait an entire year until my galaxies were back up in the night sky to try again, and hope that that night wouldn't have any weather or telescope problems. And I desperately needed these galaxies. Several billion years ago, each of them had hosted a strange phenomenon known as a gamma ray burst. Astronomers thought these bursts were coming from massive, rapidly spinning, dying stars whose cores were collapsing into black holes, cannibalizing the stars from the inside out and igniting violent jets of light that came streaking through the cosmos to arrive at Earth as flashes of gamma rays lasting mere seconds. Stars died all the time, but only a handful of them were flashing us like this, and nobody could explain why. I had built my entire PhD thesis on the idea that studying the chemical makeup of these stars' home galaxies, the same gas and dust they had been born from, was the key to understanding why they exploded the way they did. Subaru was one of the only telescopes in the world capable of such observations, and the day crew had said it was probably giving me a false alarm. If I called off the night, I'd be giving up what could be my only opportunity to ever study these galaxies, losing a linchpin of my thesis research in the process. Of course, having the largest piece of glass in the world sitting in pieces on the dome floor wouldn't help matters either. I looked at the telescope operator and she looked back at me. I was the observing astronomer, so with all of my 24-year-old, third-year grad student, still had to pay the young driver fee to rent a car wisdom, this was my call. I looked at the printout of my meticulously crafted observing plan for the night, which was falling further and further behind with every minute that Subaru sat idle. I looked at the fuzzy image of the night sky on my computer screen, coming from the small guidance camera that showed us where the telescope was pointed, helping astronomers like me find our way through a bottomless sea of stars. I turned the power off and back on again. And to find out if that worked, you'll have to read the rest of the book. <laughs> Indeed, oh, now, you, now you mentioned the, the Green Bank Telescope, which is yes, this one. This was an exquisite 300 foot across radio telescope in Green Bank, West Virginia, and it operated for a long time. It was one of the first big, enormous radio telescopes that we ever had. And I tell the story in the book of what happened to it, that one night due to what turned out to be a very minor engineering failure, it went from this to what you'll see on the next slide, which is this. Oh. So I've read accounts of people in the middle of the night, because this did happen during nighttime observing, even though radio telescopes can observe during the day. I've read accounts of them driving back up the road and the headlights of their car just hitting this mass of twisted metal and just not even believing what they were seeing. It, yeah, pretty good. For, a, for a long time, it was the infamous worst telescope collapse that anybody had known about. And I published my book before Arecibo happens. But yeah. it is, it's, these telescopes are exquisite and amazing scientific instruments, but as big as they are, they can be very delicate. Yeah, absolutely. Most big telescopes, they do not let the astronomers point it. We give a list of positions, a list of objects to the telescope operator, because there are places we could crash the telescope into the dome, into supports, into various things. So all the time at Keck, we had a telescope operator up at the top, we're running the instruments off on the side. Um, yeah. One of, one of my stories that scared me, I was at the Lick 3 meter, uh, Lick Observatory, just uh, east of San Jose. I was a graduate student at UCSC. And I was, uh, this was after I was a graduate student. I was at UCLA at the time as a, probably a research astronomer. I was on the 3 meter doing our program of observations and observing, observing. And out of the blue, I just messed up the control panel on the instrument. I closed a wrong window. I did something and I thought, gosh, what have I done? Right that second, as I closed it, the fire alarm went off. This horrible, the klaxon started sounding, this horrible alarm. And I just thought, 
that's not supposed to happen when I crash the instrument <laughs> because the instrument's on us. If we if we fool out, now these were short observations, so it was no big deal. I was losing a five minute observation maybe, but I was immediately panicked and thought, oh my God, what have I done to the telescope? The telescope operator said, you need to exit. That's the fire alarm, something's going on. And if the halon system goes off, it fills the dome with air you can't breathe, it's really bad. So I left, I go outside. The astronomer that was on what's known as the cat, it's a little small, small telescope that's on the side of the dome sends the light down to our huge Hamilton spectrograph down in the, the basement. She was making observations and said, oh my God, I thought it was me. I reached down to plug in a heater down below. I was cold in the control room. The second I plugged it in, these alarms started going off. So both of us thought it was us. Instead, it was the RA motor on the three meter burned out. So an electric motor that controls, that tracks the big telescope had burned out. Um, it was no big deal. It's just smoke filled this pier that was inside. They had to get the smoke in, cleared out. I thought, oh gosh, I'm done for the night probably. And I said, well, what about tomorrow? And they said, oh yeah, you'll be back tomorrow for sure. It was like a three night run or a five night run. The crew, who was also the volunteer fire department at the time up there, was also the day crew. They just went and grabbed the backup RA motor off the shelf and they went to putting it together that night. They were doing it by morning. They were like, it's back working again. You'll be fine for tomorrow night. It was amazing. The crew at Lick Observatory is just incredible, but things like that happen. You're observing in the middle of the night and all of a sudden you have alarms going off and klaxons oh, and yeah. whatever. So if you want to hear more of the good stories, be sure to pick up Emily's book, um, The Last Stargazers, and um, you're in for some really good stories, some good storytelling, and uh, enjoy it. Go to your local oh, book. Definitely. I've got a, uh, I've got a copy here, and I want to give you credit here, Dr. Levesque, for the best chapter title I've ever heard in all the years I've been reading books. The chapter title, folks out there listening, is The Harm from the Bullets Was Extraordinarily Small. That alone is enough reason to grab a book, folks. I, I've really enjoyed it. What, what really makes that chapter title excellent is I did not write it. I am quoting a report yeah. <laughs> explaining That's an right. incident that happened at a telescope. The harm from the bullets was extraordinarily small. That comes right after the chapter titled Hours Lost Six Reason Volcano. Female. So <laughs> there's a wide spread of stories in the book. <laughs> Absolutely. Astronomer. In fact, being an astronomer for a while was one of the most dangerous professions because we would drive up a mountain, stay up all night long, and a lot of us would just drive back down the mountain if you had a one night run. So driving down a mountain early in the morning after not sleeping wasn't so safe. And then also it was a percentage thing. There weren't a lot of astronomers. You kill a couple of them. You've killed a large percentage of them back in the day. We're still there aren't a lot of us these days either. So I want to turn to just a couple of uh, the questions that came in the chat. For Emily, before we go on down to lunch, um, one question was: Are you going to do the read for the audiobook? Because people evidently quite enjoyed your read. Is that a possibility? So the audiobook is already recorded. Um, I would have loved to read it, but we got a wonderful narrator named Janet Metzger to record it, um, and you can now buy the audiobook um, wherever you buy books. Um, if, if, if I can plug one more project of mine, though, if people did want to hear me talk more about science, um, I recently released a series for the Great Courses um, titled Great Heroes and Discoveries of Astronomy. So you can get a little DVD copy or you can just stream it. And it's the stories of some of the big discoveries we've seen in astronomy and the people who made them, including um, there's a lecture that talks in part about um, Carolyn Shoemaker, who I know we'll be talking about a little later tonight. Very, very nice. Excellent. Um well, one question we had that I can answer, someone wanted to know how stars can grow if, um, how a massive star can grow. I think they were talking about there's so much energy coming out of it. And that's absolutely a limit. Um, an astronomer named Eddington, if my memory goes back to it, Eddington limit, you balance the radiation coming off of it with the material trying to fall on. And eventually the star will get hot enough, energetic enough, the winds are strong enough, you just stop that accretion. Now, earlier, before all these supernovae made all these heavy elements, you could make bigger stars. You could make more massive stars because the light can leave hydrogen and helium easier than it can leave an atmosphere that's sprinkled with iron and calcium and all these other elements that make it hard for the light to leave. So it's a very good question. So Emily, I'm gonna modify the question a little. What is the most massive star that could be formed today, given that there's all these heavier elements that kind of stop it from forming? Oh, we argue about this in yeah, I know. That's astronomy. <laughs> but right around, 
we are right around about 100 to 300 ish times the mass of our sun. Um, we'll often run models simulating how stars of different masses um, go through their lives. And a lot of times the biggest mass we'll simulate is about 120, 150. There's individual stars that people think they might have found that are more massive. But like you said, it gets hard to keep stars like this stable. I will yeah. point out that the star I mentioned when we were talking, Eta Carina, that star that had faked its own death and done something that looked like a supernova, Stars like that, we think, might do those sort of weird death throws because they're approaching the Eddington limit. And the way that I describe this to my students is it's like they're shining themselves apart. And in a sort of last ditch effort to stay stable, we think they might puff off all that mass to stay okay. Now, this is still hotly debated, but it gets right at that sort of limit of how massive and how luminous stars can get. Interesting. Fantastic. Although I do have to admit that was a very astronomer thing to do to give a factor of three error in the hundred to three hundred. We're pinning it down any day now. That's in astronomy. That's absolutely the same yeah. number. It absolutely <laughs> is. It's just okay, you know. yeah. 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 So anybody that wants to know, are we really speaking astronomy astronomer tonight? We sure are. We're go, we're going full full blown. Um, one <laughs> last question. Somebody want to know: Can planets be seen in New York? They sure can. Absolutely. Planets are some of the stuff we observe at Griffith Observatory, downtown LA, the lights of Hollywood, they don't bother us at all. New York, as long as skies are clear and you know where to look, sure, absolutely, you can see them. I just want to say round of applause again. This has been great fun chatting with you about massive stars and about your book. I look forward to being able to read it myself. Um, Chris has our department copy. I just, that's his <laughs> own copy he picked up. Um, but I want a hard copy of it. I do. I could have bought the electronic version today, but I'm going to go down to LA's uh, the last bookstore and pick it up this weekend. So, and everybody should too. 